Genesis chapter 27, uh, beginning at verse 41, and we're going to read through to the end uh, of Genesis 28. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I'll kill my brother Jacob. When the words of her oldest son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, listen, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran and stay with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, till your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you've done to him. Then I'll send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hittite women. If Jacob marries a Hittite woman like one of them, what good is my life? Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him and commanded him, don't take a wife from the Canaanite women. Go at once to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob not to marry a Canaanite woman. Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Padan Aram. Esau realised that his father Isaac disproved of the Canaanite women. So Esau went to Ishmael and married in addition to his other wives, Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Nebaioth. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Ward Haram. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching heaven. God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him saying, I I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land you are now sleeping on. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. You'll spread out toward the west, the east, the north and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord's in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it, named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a marker will be God's house, and I'll give to you a tenth of all that you give to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, open your newsletters, you'll find an outline there on the left hand side, some questions on the top right, Uh, God willing my voice will keep going and we'll see how we go, if not Ben will get up and uh, do his best with the copious notes that I leave him. Uh, I've just finished a terrific book on holidays, I started before the holidays, Uh, Warwick Stiller lent it to me, Uh, if you want to read it, uh, please note down the title, Ghost Empire. Uh, by a guy called Richard Feidler, who seems to have lots of conversations. Uh, It's the history of Constantinople, uh, modern-day Istanbul. Uh, So much of that book was foreign to me, Uh, and it was highlighted to me that so much in the world has changed. Uh, The way in which countries govern themselves, uh, through to what you did in your daily life, uh, into the areas of how you ran your religion and your social norms. Uh, That was really fascinating in the world we're in today, to be exposed to that kind of world and to notice how much has changed. But I also realise that a lot's still the same, isn't it? Uh, People are violent. People are selfish. Politics is all about intrigue 
and getting to the top. The world is dominated by invasion and war. Pandemic and illness is everywhere. Conspiracy and deception dominate. And people struggle to live in a society where living costs are always rising. Some things change. Some stay the same, don't they? You know that phrase, don't you? And when we open a book like Genesis, and this is the fourth year we've been in Genesis, that kind of phrase should stick with us, shouldn't it? Some things change. Some stay the same. It's a world very different to ours. Uh, Do you know in our world today, there are more devices connected to the internet than there are people in the world? In those days, they had to talk to people face to face. Some things change, some stay the same. In those days, they lived in tents or used stones for pillows. Today, we live in houses with home movie theatres and we have umpteen varieties of pillows. But our families still struggle. We still have tension in our relationships. Life is about the pursuit of happiness and the good stuff, and sin damages everything. In fact, the question Genesis asks us is, where is your hope in this world? And that always stays the same, doesn't it? And we're going to dive back into Genesis this year with this passage. Let me pray, and then let's look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that it is the same, just like you who spoke it. Uh, It's eternally reliable, uh, trustworthy, and truthful. Uh, Father, as our world changes, thank you that you don't. Please apply your never-changing word to our ever-changing lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Baxter, can you bring up that first slide? Uh, This is just to get us where we are, uh, where we are in the Bible. Uh, We're returning to Genesis. Uh, That is those orange books on the top shelf. The first book, it's the first book in the Bible. Baxter, next slide. Uh, It recounts so much of our view of the world we live in. Uh, There's a timeline of the Bible, God's big picture. Genesis 1 and 2 is the creation of the world. That's over here on this side in the light green. God made the world by his word. He made humans, man and woman, equal in his image. And their job is to rule the world under him. God's people in the world God made living under his word and life is good. Genesis 3 describes what breaks the world. It's not God. It's us. Where humans think we can do a better job than God. When God's not as generous as he really sounds and God can't do what he promised. So Adam and Eve decide they can do a better job than God, don't they? Uh, We're God and you're not. And sin enters the world, that little word with I in the middle. And do you know what? God does exactly as he promised. He judged them as he rightly should. Death entered the world as God said, you can have what you want, which is life without me, which is death. And then God commits himself to the world saying, it's not always going to be like this. Someone from the woman will crush this thing called sin. Genesis 4 to 11, that's the third one there in the light green. We we see sin spread right throughout the world. A sin branches out. It's part of every single human being. And a sin, as humans move out into the world, sin moves out into the world. The whole world is fundamentally broken. And we see this continual cycle of, of humans exerting their authority against God, God judging them and then God saving them every single time even though they don't deserve it. By the time we get to Genesis 12, which is the first one here in the light blue, God says, actually, I'm going to show you what I've always intended to do. I'm committed to fixing up this broken world. He picks a bloke called Abraham who has nothing to recommend him, nothing to recommend him. And he says, through your mob, through your family, Abraham, I'm going to reverse the curse. I'm going to bring blessing. And so God promises through Abraham to bring about his people in God's place, living under God's word, and so to change the world and to deal with its brokenness. Genesis 13 on, we see that unpacked as God commits to Abraham in something called a covenant, a binding agreement where God says, this is what I'll do. And Abraham trusts him and obeys him. 
And that covenant passes through Abraham's family to his son Isaac, his wife Rebekah, and they have sons, Esau and Jacob, twins. Throughout this, as things change and move, and let me tell you, we're talking decades here in chapters. Okay? It just plods along. They move their tent, they kick their sheep, they find some food, they get some water. And things don't change as God is committed to them. God's promise doesn't change. Their response should never change. And at each time, God is revealed as thoroughly consistent. So when we get to chapter 27, verse 41, why is Esau so murderous? I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verse 41 of Genesis 27. Esau held a grudge against Jacob. Well, brothers do that all the time, don't they? Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I'll kill my brother Jacob. Esau has murder in his mind, his heart, and his hands are itchy. Why does he have this murder? Well, we're given the reason, aren't we? It's not a remarkable reason in one sense, is it? It's there in verse 41. He's got a grudge against his brother. Well, that happens in most families, doesn't it? A grudge. This is something slightly different, isn't it? Because here we get a clear reminder to remember what's been going on in this family. Remember Isaac and Rebecca have been given twins by God. Remember they weren't able to have kids. They pleaded with God to have kids and God gave them twins and they were in twin warfare in the womb. So bad in Genesis 25 that Rebecca cries out to God and says, God, I wish I was dead. What's going on? And God answers her in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. Two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Did you catch that? Two nations. They're going to come from those two boys. And the younger one will rule. The older one will will serve the younger. God is making very clear that at a moment where there is nothing to recommend either of these two babies in the womb, God is going with the younger one. It's a sign that God does things because of his mercy, not because there's anything to recommend one of those two battling infants, but because of God's kindness. God is in charge. And the twins are born. Esau's the older, isn't he? He's hairy, he's red, he's outdoorsy, he's the favourite of Isaac. Jacob's the younger. He grasps at his brother Hill. He's an indoors boy. As someone at Bible study said, he's a mummy's boy and he's the favourite of Rebecca. They're out working for their father one day, moving sheep around in the paddock. Esau's gone out to get dinner. He can't find anything. Jacob's cooking dinner back at the camp. As Esau comes in, he's famished. It smells delicious. It looks meaty. Jacob says, I'll give you some tucker if you give me your birthright. Esau is so famished that he sells his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. He turns his back on the grace of God. He didn't earn that birthright, did he? He just came out first. That's the grace of God. And he turns his back on the grace of God for a bowl of lentils. A little later, Isaac is fearing that his death is coming. He's blind. He won't die for another 40 years, but he's got a case of the man flu, perhaps. Who knows? He calls for his son Esau to come in and cook him his favourite stew. Esau comes in and says, I'll do it so Isaac can bless him. Rebecca hears what goes on. And so the parents compete, don't they? Isaac disobeys God's promise, doesn't he? Remember what God said? The younger will rule. Isaac is actively seeking to rebel against God's promise. Because he wants to go to the older, doesn't he? He wants the older to rule. And then Rebecca shows that she doesn't trust God's promise. God seems to have checked out, so Rebecca checks in. And she intervenes. And so together, Jacob and Rebecca deceive Isaac. And the blessing of the family goes to the younger and not the older. And Esau gets the crumbs and the family is broken. You can understand the grudge, can't you? (laughs) That's where we're at. He wants to murder his brother. 
He wants to wipe him from the face of the earth. And we mustn't miss this moment as we come back into Genesis. We mustn't miss this. Jacob is the younger. That's where the people of God will come from. God has said that very clearly. That will be my nation. And Esau wants to kill that nation. Esau wants to kill that nation. Esau has been willful. He has turned his back on the grace of God. He has been deceived as to what is rightfully his. He'll father a nation that follows him, and that nation, not the people of God, will right through the pages of the Bible seek to destroy the people of God. When God's people come into the promised land in Exodus 17, who's waiting for them? Esau's descendants, ready to kill them. As David flees from Saul as the promised king, who dobs in and makes sure all the priests are killed? One of Esau's descendants in 1 Samuel 22. As God's people are taken into exile, who's cheering from the sidelines and sniping? In Psalm 137, it's all of Esau's descendants. As Esther lives in exile, who seeks to destroy and wipe out the people of God? It's a descendant of Esau. As Jesus is born, who seeks to kill all the boys aged two and under? A man connected with the line of Esau. As Jesus dies on the cross, who is the king who approves along with Pilate his death? A man connected with the line of Esau. Ever since verse 41, not the people of God have shaken their fist at God and sought the demise of his promise and his people. You see, the universal problem is the problem of murderous, rebellious human sin. It's always sought to shake its fist at God and to do away with his authority, his promise, and his people, and it's part of every single human being. What's the hope for the world when such murder is afoot? Well, surely God's people are doing okay. I mean, you'd think that would be the case. I mean, that's why God would have chosen Jacob, isn't it, in the womb, because he knew what he was going to be like. Surely there's something to recommend this family. I'm at point three on the outline. You know how it works in tents? <laughs> Have you ever tried to keep a secret when you're camping in tents? It's really hard. And that's what happens with Esau, isn't it? The rumour gets to Rebecca. Esau wants to kill Jacob. So do you notice in verse 42, she talks to Jacob. Hey, Jacob, I, I, I don't want to lose you two in one day. So here's my secret plan. Why don't you go 735 kilometres, spend a couple of days there and come back, and Esau will have forgotten the whole thing. Just so I don't lose both of you in one day. It's a ridiculous plan, isn't it? That's what she confides to Jacob. How does she present it to Isaac? I look there in verse 46. So Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hittite women. If Jacob marries a Hittite woman like one of them, <coughs> what good is my life? Yeah, some things change. Some stay the same, don't they? Rebecca's the same. She's a schemer, she's a meddler, she's a deceiver. Just as she did with Jacob when they deceived Isaac and got the blessing, here she takes matters into her own hands. I suspect our world would look at her and go, gee, she's a can-do woman. Gee, she's got some get up and go. What initiative. No, she distrusts the promise of God. She thinks God has checked out, so she steps in. Does that sound familiar? And the plan is communicated in a lie. It's a lie that deceives Isaac. Some things change and some stay the same. The man's got the initiative of a beanbag, hasn't he? He just sits there and his wife acts on him. He's a weak and a passive and an inactive man. He's easily deceived. He doesn't seem to care about the promises of God, does he? He's got them, but you know, he's just apathetic and lazy. There's no enthusiasm for the promise of God in this man, is there? 
He's taken in by Rebecca's lie. And so he sends Jacob back to the family home to find a wife. And it's exactly what happened with Abraham, but there's none of the enthusiasm about the promise of God, is there, that we saw with Abraham. And so Jacob sets off, and as he does, do you notice the words that Isaac sends him off with? Did you see them there in verses 3 and 4? It, it's just, it's almost discordant. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. There's all this deception and brokenness and apathy. And then you have this clear and ringing statement of the promise of God. In almost the same words as Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Hey, Jacob, as you go, remember that the promise lies with you. And it's given by Isaac. Well, Esau's watching on, isn't he? Look there in verse 6. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob not to marry a Canaanite woman. And Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Padan Aram. Esau realized that his father disapproved of the Canaanite women. So Esau went to Ishmael and married in addition to his other wives, Mahalath, daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Nebaioth. It's really quite a sad parody, isn't it? Jacob's in the good books because of the wife he's getting. Gee, maybe I can get in the good books by a good deed here. Uh, getting a wife with the right family tree. Uh, why don't, what a genius brainwave. Why, why don't I marry one of Ishmael's descendants? You know, that son of Abraham that was kicked out of the family? It, it's actually quite a sad moment as you see Esau grasping and hoping that a good deed will get him right with his father that will bring him back in line with Jacob. I think our hearts should be sinking at this point, shouldn't they? I, I, I hope, if, if you are anything like me, I hope that you recognise yourself in this family. Some things change. Some stay the same. Amongst the people of God, there is often a distrust that God will do exactly as he promised. And so we intervene, don't we? We step in because we think God's not up to the job and and we can make the promises of God happen better. Uh, Amongst God's people, there is the apathy of Isaac, isn't there? The the knowledge of the promises of God, the promises that we want to hold on to, but yeah, gee whiz. There's other stuff I like, like stew. There's other things I want to do. Uh, The promises are there, but uh, I just want to treat them lightly. I just want them there as an insurance policy, not as a commitment. Uh, Amongst the people of God, there's often the desperation of Esau, isn't there? Look how terrible it's been, and perhaps I can cover it up with this good deed that will get me in the good books, that will bring me back level. And there's no hope in Esau And there's no hope in God's people. It's a pretty dispiriting start to our return to Genesis, isn't it? Look there in verse 10. I'm at point four on the outline. (coughs) Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head and lay down in that place. If this was a movie... The imagery and the music would communicate a lonely man, wouldn't it? You'd see the sunset, you'd see a barren desert, and you'd see the silhouette of one man. Because it really is lonesome. Here's the father of the nation that God says will bring blessing to the world. He's walking out of the land. He's walking away from a family that he's broken. He's a man we know is grasping and deceptive. He's a man who is moving back to where Abraham had come out of. It's a horrible image. And we're meant to get to this point and go, is there any hope? Look at verse 11, verse 12. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching to heaven. God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him saying, I am the Lord, 
the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I'll give you and your offspring the land that you are now sleeping on. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. You'll spread out towards the west and the east, the north and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this land for I'll not leave you until I've done what I've promised. What a dream. The stairway, the picture is it's been placed there by God. Very different to the last stairway we met where humans tried to get up to God. And on the staircase are angels and they're not descending. What are they doing first? They're going up. They've always been here. God knows what's going on. And who's standing next to it speaking to Jacob? The very God who has committed to the world. The God who says, I made a promise to Abraham. I made a promise to Isaac. And lo and behold, I'm making a promise to you. Do you notice the promise? I mean, and nothing about this bloke recommends him to God. This is a man who should be written out of the family will. And yet God says, I commit to you. And he uses exactly the same words as he'd use with Abraham. I'm going to give you a family. And through that family, you will have a land. And through that family and land, you'll obey me and you will reverse the curse in the world even though you are a wretched and deceptive and grasping and deceitful man. Isn't that the definition of grace? That God takes a lonely man who has done nothing to recommend him to God and God says, I'm committed to you. You're mine, and through you I will change the world. What a commitment from God. You see, there's no hope in Esau. There's no hope in the people of God. There is only hope in the God of those people, the God who says, I am committed to you. And Jacob wakes up, and gee, it's a great response because it's so like ours, isn't it? He kind of gets it, but he kind of doesn't. Yeah, look what happens when he wakes up, verse 16. He awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord's in this place. I I didn't know it. As if that had changed where you sleep. He was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. He's rightly struck by God, isn't he? (laughs) Grace should lead to fear, right fear. How amazing that this God would do this for me. Jacob knows what he's like. He knows that he's there because he broke his family and he deceived his father and his siblings. And he goes, why, why would God deal with me? How wonderful is it? And then he doesn't quite grasp it, does he? Because he connects God to a place. <laughs> and then when you look at what he says in verses 18 to 22, what's the most repeated word? If, if, if. Uh, if God does come through with him, uh, maybe then I'll follow it. It's not for another 20 odd years when Jacob returns here after 20 years of discipling disappointment that he finally grasps it, that he finally understands grace. Does he sound a little familiar? We live in a world very different to Jacob's. I'm at point five. We live in a geographically different area. We live stream church, g'day. We communicate with devices. We travel and cook in ways that are different to Jacob. Things have changed, haven't they? But some things remain the same, don't they? There is murderous opposition to God and it's called sin. There still isn't much to recommend the people of God in and of themselves, is there? We know our nature and we know our sin. We intervene because we think God's not up to it. We lack enthusiasm for the promise of God and we settle for apathy. We look to good deeds to cover our unwillingness to actually accept the promise of God. We see grace clearly just like Jacob and we know it's goodness and then we limit it with conditions. We should rightly be confronted by this mirror of us as the people of God. Some things stay the same. And so does the hope, doesn't it? The very same hope of a God who would commit to a people who have nothing to recommend them. The hope that is God's commitment to a broken world. Jesus said to Nathaniel, 
Do you believe only because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than this. Then Jesus said, I assure you, you'll see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Did you hear those words? Who spoke them? Jesus spoke them. Did you see what he said? Who are the angels walking on now? It's not a stairway. It's a man. Who's the gate between heaven and earth? Who's the commitment of God's grace to a people who have nothing to recommend them? It's the bloke Jesus. Who is the commitment of God's grace that he will not leave his people until he's done as he promised. Some things change. Some stay the same. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for the mirror held up to human nature. And thank you for the exposure of your kindness. Thank you that that comes in the shape, life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us to hold on to him. Amen.